Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Today on the show, we have Christy Hogstead. She is the author of Beneath the Surface, a teen's guide to reaching out when you or your friend is in crisis. Ever since her husband completed suicide in 2012, after years of struggling with clinical depression by running in front of a train, she has dedicated her life to helping abolish the stigma of mental illness and suicide. A certified grief recovery specialist and grief and loss facilitator for recovering addicts at South Coast Behavioral Health, Christy frequently speaks at high schools. She is also the host of the Grief Girl podcast and lives in Orange County, California. Welcome, Christy, to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. So I know that you lost your husband to a really sort of devastate, I mean, suicide's always devastating, but um, I, you know, I heard your story and the story you told. He stepped in front of a train. It was a train that your father-in-law was on as he was kind of coming to, to try to help him. Um, And, you know, I think people can have these experiences and it can either take them to the depths of despair permanently or they figure out a way to make meaning. And you've really figured out a way to make meaning out of his tragic circumstances. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I remember laying in bed one morning and I thought, you know, I'm really tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of feeling depressed and dark. So I gave myself an ultimatum. I thought you have two choices. You can either wallow in self-pity and be a victim of your circumstances, or you can take that pain and you can do thing with it and maybe help somebody else and prevent them from having to go to that same dark place that you're in. So, you know, that was kind of a a no-brainer for me. I had to pull myself out of bed and say, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to use my pain to help other people. So then I just became on this mission for suicide education and prevention. And what was, what did you do before you became a grief and loss counselor? What what were you before? Bill and I Um, were in the fitness business. We had a big gym. I taught spinning and Pilates. He ran the weight room. We had a vacation home in Rosarito, Mexico. We lived in a beautiful home overlooking the Pacific Ocean. So we seemed to have this ideal life. So people from the outside looking in would think, wow, you know, they seem to have everything. And that's not what was going on. It was for a short period of time. But the longer Bill and I were together, I started to notice signs of mental illness. And so for some time, I, we just kind of kept that a secret and just kind of went on with our seemingly perfect lives. And did you guys acknowledge it between the two of you or was there little acknowledgement of what was going on? There was at all? really absolutely no acknowledgement from either one of us and particularly Bill because I don't think, looking back, that he was so sure of what was happening. You know, he started to withdraw and isolate. And he, I like to tell people and, and teens in schools when I go speak to them is, you know, all these warning signs and risk factors, when you put them all together, the end result is think of your loved one as a person that you no longer recognize. And that's exactly what was happening. I didn't know what was going on. He bought into the stigma of mental illness. So he was not about to reach out and get help because I think in his upbringing as a young boy, he was brought up that if you cry or you show emotion, that that is a sign of weakness. And so he never really owned his depression. Mm -hmm. And I think I didn't understand it at the time either. I thought it was a passing phase. And then if he got the right doctor, the right psychologist, the right clinician, the right pill, that I would have my old husband back. So Mm -hmm. neither one of us really acknowledged it to ourselves or to anybody else. 
And did he have, did he seek treatment? I will say that we went to to different professionals, mental health professionals. He actually was put on a 51 hold, you know, which, you know, is a three day involuntary suicide watch because he had a prior attempt. He'd taken a bottle of Ambien and he'd actually left me a suicide note. So once he was at Mission Hospital, I thought, oh, wow, I'm finally going to get him a bed and get him help and get him treatment. And after that three-day hold was up, they released him, and we were back to square one. So Because right, all there, someone I, needs to say is, I'm not suicidal anymore, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay. Right. The psychiatrist came in and said, why did you take that bottle of Ambien? And he said, I have insomnia, and I can't sleep. And he said were you trying to take your life? And he said, no. And they released him. And part of the problem too, as you well know, is that our mental health system is very broken. There weren't enough beds for treatment. And so there are a lot of people that are just pushed through the system and released. And it's really tough to get help, even though you are trying everything in your power to help your loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so... So how how long after that did he complete his suicide? It was a few months later. You know, okay. we got home and we were back to square one. And I went back on my mission to try to fix him, you know, to get him that right mental health care professional. And then I would say three months later, um, he actually had a plan and he followed through on it. But within that time, Looking back, and when I went on his search engine on the computer, he had been planning this for some time. He mm-hmm. had Googled different ways to take his life. There was cyanide poison. He was up to date on the train schedules, both north and south in the area where we live. So he had had a plan. I think he just hadn't quite decided when he was going to follow through on it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, I don't know what... Most people who are listening know, but typically it's probably pretty unusual for a man to take pills as an attempt. Usually men are much more um, vigorous in their suicide attempts and end up completing them because they usually take more drastic measures like, you know, a gun or stepping in front of a train, things along those lines that really result in death versus uh, hospitalization. So absolutely. Women are four times more likely to attempt suicide, but men are four times more likely to complete suicide because as you said, their methods are much more violent, you know, mm-hmm. hanging, shooting, uh, stepping in front of, uh, of a moving a vehicle or an object. So I think once men decide that they are going to follow through with the act, they are going to make sure that they succeed. Where sometimes for women, it's it's a cry for help. And we are going to typically find a more passive way, like taking pills and falling asleep or poisoning. So There is a radical difference in the methods that men and women choose, and the men, that's why men are four times more successful because of the violent nature of the methods. Mm -hmm. And so what made you, because your first shift was into grief counseling, right? Yes. And now a book for teens, so why why teens? I mean, your husband was a teen at some point, but not when this okay. happened. Well, you know, my whole mission is suicide education and prevention. And I and what I'm finding through my grief recovery work is that the moms that I work with, that you know, their teens, their children are having mental health issues. They're really concerned about the stigma of their the their peers and their children's peers, and they don't want to put their teens in a position where other kids don't want to hang out with them anymore. So to abolish that stigma and to change the culture of how we think about mental illness, that doesn't start in your 50s because my husband was in his 50s, and by then it was too late. He'd already bought into that stigma. So to change the culture, it needs to start with our youth. And as a former credentialed health educator, I know that it's very difficult for parents and teachers and administrators to start these conversations. 
So that's what inspired me to write Beneath the Surface so that that will serve as a resource in schools and at home for parents, teachers, and teens to understand all these different issues our teens are facing because it's a completely different world growing up now. You know, they have, right? I mean, they have so many different issues <laughs> than we had growing up and they need, they need a reference. They need a resource and they need to know that they're not alone and that they matter. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, obviously, I have three kids. One is going to be 13 next week. Oh, so she'll be 13 by the time this airs. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I have, I have a ton of thoughts on that. I have a daughter and I have two boys. And I think that, you know, certainly with boys, you see a shift, particularly you talked about, uh, you talked about emotion, uh, that at, at a point where it becomes not okay to express that right? It becomes not yeah. okay to cry. And so it's like almost when that point happens, like as a society, it seems like we really need to be addressing even even earlier than that. Like the expression of emotion is important, whatever that emotion is. You know, I talk with people all the time in my practice, like you don't suppress the emotion, let it come out. The, the danger is when you suppress it, then it, you know, then it takes on a life of its own. Um, But I think the other thing when you're talking about the stigma is I think also parents feel ashamed if their child has to seek treatment, because what does that mean for me as a parent if I have to put my kid in therapy? Um, Absolutely. Parents, and I know this firsthand from working with them, They buy into the stigma, just like I bought into it, just like Bill bought into it. And that's where the change needs to start because Mm -hmm. we are all human and we all have mental health issues. Well, and I'll never forget um, that when I I was in therapy for a long time, I have no, I'm a therapist. So clearly I have no issue with being in therapy, talking about therapy, encouraging therapy. And I'll never forget when my therapist said to me, the best thing that your child can do in ther- is use therapy because it shows that they have enough healthy attachment that they know that they can go to other people for help and other people are there to help them. Absolutely. And that-, that is not something, we don't just grow up with that. Kids need to be taught that, Right. Yeah, and, and that there's so many people that can help. Well, absolutely. And if the parents are buying into the stigma, what chance does that child have? Then they start to feel the guilt and the shame. And then the problem just keeps spiraling out of control. And kids don't want to disappoint their parents. They want approval and acceptance. And if the parent is not making it okay for them to have mental health issues, and more importantly, to talk about it, that's a real problem. And so the the feedback that I get from parents and teachers and anybody with a teen in their life is, but it's difficult for me. How do we start these conversations? So knowing, it's one thing to say we need to start those conversations and make it a normal part of our day. That's one thing. But then teaching people, here are tools to help you start that conversation. That is taking a step taking it a step further, and that's what's lacking. So what I did in Beneath the Surface is at the end of every chapter and the end of the book, I wrote discussion questions for the parent and the teacher, the administrators, so that you can sit down with your child and start conversations. And both you and the child will be on the same page, and you can use this as a resource to sit down with them and have those tough discussions. And what are some of, can you share some of the tips? Because I don't think these tips just apply to adolescents, right? Like your husband, you noticed, was starting to change. So how would someone, if they noticed those things, say something without offending the person, you know, if it's your spouse or even a friend, right? Like these these can apply. We see these things in our friends. We see them in our partners. We see them in our family. 
Well, absolutely. And those warning signs and risk factors are universal. You know, the isolation, the withdrawal, the changing and eating and sleeping habits, the talk of suicide, the risk factors like do you have depression in your family? My husband had two grandmothers who had a suicide attempt. I didn't understand the significance of that. But there were red flags everywhere. He was actually the poster child for depression and suicidal ideation. But mm-hmm. I just thought, you know, eventually that he would get better. And that's not what happened. So I think the most important way to address what's going on is for parents or a loved one, it can be your spouse, to notice a change in behavior. So it's not judgmental and it's not condescending. For example, saying things like, I could have said, Bill, you know, I noticed that you've been so quiet lately. You know, what's going on? Are you okay? Can we talk about it? Or you could say to your your child, you know, you're spending a lot of time in your room and that concerns me a little bit. Are you struggling with anything? Can we talk? And if you don't get an answer right away, realize that, hey, you know what? They may not be on your time frame and your schedule, but at least you're starting that station and let them know I'm here for you. I love you. And the line that keep those lines of communication open. So when they are ready to talk, they will come to you and it may not be on your time schedule, but it's when they are ready. So I think the best answer I can give you for that is just notice a change in their behavior. You know, like I've noticed your friends are changing or, or your, your, your skipping school or your grades are declining, you know, something going on. And I think it's so important to, for people to hear a change in behavior because adolescents are funky. (laughs) Right. And so their behavior, hormones, developmental, their brain development is kind of all over the place. And so I think too, because, you know, for parents who are aware and the culture of suicide and the, you know, movie, the 13, Re- or the TV show, or whatever it was, the 13 reasons why, there's almost sometimes a hyper awareness that parents sometimes misinterpret what is normal adolescent behavior that's developmentally appropriate for an adolescent versus a change in behavior. So can you speak a little bit to how that differs? Well, the darkness that your teen is distributing is not normal teen behavior when they are completely shutting down and isolating and they're not interested in activities that they once used to enjoy. Their energy is low. They ha- they have they're apathetic and tired all the time um, or not sleeping. So changes in eating and sleeping patterns is, you know, normal to an extent. But when they're extreme and there's lots of different signs, and like I said earlier, your child just isn't who he or she used to be. But I think that the change in friends is a big clue Um, They may also, that might be indicative of substance abuse, you know, and I have lots of parents that I've been speaking with in my grief recovery work lately that their kids are, you know, smoking pot and vaping and they're experimenting with drugs and alcohol and therefore their, their friends are changing. So, but all of these signs together um, just kind of make your child somebody that is completely different than they were prior to that. How has what you're currently doing helped you to deal with your loss? The main thing that I'm getting out of what I am doing and the writing and the speaking is that I am hopefully educating people and saving lives. And when people come up to me and they say, you know, your book made a difference. I now have an open line of communication with my teens and they're getting help. And thank you for that. And also adults that are reading the book say, you know what, everything you described in here and all those warning signs and risk factors, that spoke to me. And now I am reaching out and getting help. So even if it helps one person and saves one life, all of this is worth it for me because 
I don't want anybody to have to go through the darkness that I went through. Mm -hmm. And that really is such a tribute to Bill in so many ways, right? Because it's not just about, I mean, I think it's about making meaning out of your own life, but also making meaning out of his, right? When someone Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think Bill would be very proud of the work I'm doing and very supportive. And in a way, it's almost like, Maybe this unfolded like this for a reason, you know, because there was a point where I thought, why me? You know, this is something that happens to other people. But since I am an educator, a health educator, and I am a public speaker, and I do have those tools to get out there and use my voice to change the culture, um, I kind of feel like that is my new purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I do think that Bill gets it. And I think he's really, really proud of the work that I'm doing in his behalf. And I think so many people who experience any type of loss that that feels outside of the natural order of life, I mean, even that loss can be devastating, but I think you can kind of rationalize it a little bit more if it's a, someone who's old and they've lived a full life, right? It's still painful, but it's within the natural order of things. Um, when something tragic happens, you do have that experience of like, why did this happen to me? And I think that's where you can go dark hole or you can go bright light. Absolutely. And like I said earlier, I did have that choice. But I can't lay down and be a victim of anything that happens to me. So I have kind of rewired my brain and redeveloped a new purpose. And I think I've dialed it into to change the culture and to get rid of the stigma of mental illness. It's got to start early. I want this generation of kids and teenagers to grow up reaching out for help and not feeling any kind of shame or guilt whatsoever. And how, how do you feel like you moved to this place? Like, what helped you in your darkest hour? I think it happened and unfolded pretty organically. It wasn't something that I thought right away, I need to write a book, I need to get out in schools, and I need to I need to help our teens navigate through, you know, uh, adolescence. That didn't happen for a couple of years. But when I really sat down and thought, you know, abolishing the stigma is not going to happen for generations. So let's start young and change their mentality and the way that they think about it. So when they get to be in their 40s and 50s, there will be no more stigma because it's really tough to change the mindset of men and women in their 50s and 40s and above. That's what that's when they come to me. Exactly. Right. Right. I'm so, like, all right, we got to we got to kind of think about this as like if you were a baby. <laughs> yes, you're starting over and not everybody is open to that. You know, you if they've spent 40 years with a certain belief system about mental illness, you're probably not going to be able to change that in a few therapy sessions. Right. Right. So I think it's important to change how we parent and how we teach our, our children. And that way they'll grow up without that stigma instead of starting old and then trying to move backwards. And, and I'm sure, you know, you understand that. Right. I absolutely do. Well, this was so interesting today. And if people want to learn more about your book or more about you, where can they find you? My website is thegriefgirl.com. So if they want me to speak to their school, they want to uh, read my blogs, watch my podcasts, reach out to me, thegriefgirl.com is the place to do that. And Beneath the Surface, basically in any bookstore nationwide, it's available. And on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, et cetera. Awesome. And it will be on my um, show notes as well. So anybody that wants to see more, just click on my show notes and you can find all that information. Thank you so much today for your time, Christy. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the work you're doing. I'm always, obviously, what I do for a living, what you are doing helps what I do ultimately because- Thank you as well. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? 
curious about what comes next and what it all means, you can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life, death, and the space between and hit subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you.